want to welcome everybody who's joining us today for this special presentation of the Parent Education Series and nonprofit, The Parent Venture. My name is Charlene Margo. I am the founder of the Parent Education Series and proud co-founder of our new nonprofit, The Parent Venture. We are bringing you a special presentation that is a San Mateo County-wide collaboration sponsored by Get Healthy San Mateo County, the Sequoia Healthcare District, Peninsula Healthcare District, and the Parent Venture. So a huge thank you to our sponsors today. Without your support, this event would not be possible. So we have with us the co-authors of the book, The Self-Driven Child, Dr. Bill Stixert and Ned Johnson. We have welcomed them in person before to the San Francisco Bay Area, but we could not be more thrilled to have them back, albeit virtually. They are in slightly different places, the two of them also, but we're just thrilled to have you. So again, um, we know this is an important and timely topic to be talking about resilience and balance and limit setting. With over 500 registered attendees for today's program, we know that this is a topic that is very important and much on parents' minds. And I know you're gonna be hearing a lot of very practical tips today from our friends, Bill and Ned. Um, if you need Spanish, Spanish interpretation, we have Cynthia Hinesterosa, who is in the background, offering simultaneous Spanish. And if you need that service, at the bottom of your Zoom screen, there's a globe. And if you click on the globe icon and then Spanish, you will hear her in Spanish, okay? The rest of you can be on English. We are speaking on English. This event is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel video library. So again, thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you to our sponsors. Let me just tell you a little bit how today's format is going to work. Our presenters again, Dr. Stixert and Ned Johnson will be speaking to you, just the two of them together in conversation for about 45 minutes. And then we will then open it up to you, the audience for some questions. In the chat, my partner Bev Hartman will put in, be putting links about their book, about the parent venture, about our sponsors and a short survey we hope you will take at the end of the evening or the end of the presentation. And then we ask that you put your questions in the Q&A box. So feel free to talk to us or to one another in the chat, but please put your questions in the Q&A box. I will be reading those and moderating them today. Um, if you can keep the questions as general as possible so that we can get to as many as we can and inform parents. All right, so we've gotten the logistics. Let me tell you a little bit about our presenters. Ned Johnson. Ned Johnson is an author, speaker, and founder of Prep Matters, an educational company providing academic tutoring, educational plan planning, and standardized test preparation. A self-professed tutor geek, Ned is a renowned expert in the fields of test prep, stress regulation, sleep, and student performance. He coaches his clients to manage their anxiety and find motivation to reach their full potential. Ned is the co-author of Conquering the SAT, How Parents Can Help Students Overcome the Pressure and Succeed, and with Bill Stixrud, pictured here. He is the co-author of The Self-Driven Child, The Science and Sense of Giving Your Kids More Control Over Their Lives. Their book explores how fostering children's autonomy can help kids face their anxiety and develop intrinsic motivation. Ned is a sought after speaker and teen coach on study skills, parent teen dynamics and teen anxiety. And his work has been featured in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the, New, the Wall Street Journal, NPR, BBC, and many others. Welcome Ned, so glad to have you today. Great All to right. be with you. Dr. Bill Stixrud, PhD, is a clinical neuropsychologist and founder of the Stixrud Group, a lifespan neuropsychology practice. He is also a member of the adjunct faculty of the Children's National Medical Center, and he holds a faculty appointment as assistant clinical professor of psychiatry and pediatrics at the George Washington School of Medicine. Dr. Stixrud is a frequent lecturer, and he's authored scientific articles on transcendental meditation. We'll tell you a little bit about that today, and book chapters on meditation and the integration of the arts into education. Dr. Stixrud has been quoted in publications including the New York Times, the Washington Post, Scientific American, Time, NPR, Business Week, and Vogue. He holds a doctorate degree in school psychology from the University of Minnesota, and he did his training in neuropsychology at the Children's Hospital in Boston as a fellow of the Harvard Medical School 
and Tufts New England Medical Center. He is also, most importantly, a rock and roll musician and plays in a band called Close Enough. Please join me in a really warm welcome for today's speakers, Bill Sixard and Ned Johnson. Take it away, gentlemen. Thank you so much, Charlene. We love talking about this stuff and we love what you do. And so you can probably tell by looking at me, I, I, I've, been, I've worked with kids for a long time and long enough that I, 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 um, I have a, I, my granddaughter who, when she was five, a couple of years ago, she said, Grandpa, how old are you? I said, 65. And she said, starting from one? <laughs> <laughs> it's, all, it's all good. I mean, I, I, I've been testing. I, I, I'm a neuropsychologist and I test kids for a living and I never get tired of it. And it, it's a wonderful way to make a living. And I try to figure out if they're having problems, what's going wrong, what's going right, and how to help them. And Ned and I started lecturing together, I don't know, eight or nine years ago. And, and we became friends and we, we thought a lot alike. And we lectured about motivation and stress and sleep and various things. And maybe four years ago, we decided to write a book and we, we were talking about what's the best way to organize the, the, the things that we think are most helpful. And Ned at one point said, I think that everything we think is helpful to parents and educators is related to a sense of control. And so and we, we thought about, well, the, the two concerns that we have about kids developing now are number one, all these stress-related mental health problems. And number two, we see a lot of kids who, who just have motivational problems. Either they just, a lot of kids that I see who have learning problems or ADHD or they're depressed, they just don't work that hard. And they, they just feel, what's the point? And a lot of Ned's kids, and some of mine too, um, are, are just completely obsessively driven. They'd sacrifice their health, they'd sacrifice their family, their, their, their mental health to, to, for, to, for high achievement. And they don't have what we consider to be that healthy self-drive to develop themselves as people, as students, as people who have a lot to contribute to this world. And so we, we thought, we, so in terms of this mental health part, I mean, we know that, 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 that there's a huge incidence of, of, of anxiety, depression, loneliness. And certainly it, we see it in, in, in kids living in poverty. We see it just as dramatically in, in affluent kids. And, and, uh, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, a couple of years ago, published this paper looking at the, the causes of these mental health problems in teenagers and young adults. And they concluded the main problems were, were poverty, trauma, discrimination, and excessive pressure to excel. And so we, we think that, that uh, this mental health situation, it, it's unpre unprecedented levels of mental health problems. And it gets worse in college. A lot of parents ask us, does it get better when they go off to college? And it, it doesn't actually get worse. Now, here's the connection with the sense of control. That every place that we look to try to understand how kids develop that healthy self-motivation, all the arrows point in the direction of autonomy. And, and, and Ned's going to talk about motivation in a couple of minutes. In terms of the mental health piece, we, we, we know that there's a, there's a neuroscientist in Montreal who says, here's the four things that make life stressful. And she summarizes them with the novelty, nuts. And you can check off every single one in spades during co this COVID crisis. It's novelty, unpredictability, perceived threat, and a low sense of control. But the S is the sense of control. So nuts, it makes it, stress makes you nuts. And, so, and, and it's that low sense of control that's the most stressful thing. And what we know that when, when you're anxious or when you're, your thinking is out of control, if you're depressed, you have no sense of control, you can't get out of bed. And so we know that there's a strong connection between a sense of control and mental health. And one of the guys who put this sense of control on the map, Steve Mayer, who was a scientist at University of Colorado, basic experiment where he has rats in a cage, rat A, rat B, they're in a plexiglass cage, rat, the tail's outside the cage, little uh, wheel inside the cage. Rat A, tail gets shocked, wants the shock to stop, turns the wheel. And he learns that they, he turns the wheel. If you learn, he learns that they turns the wheel, the shock stops. He has this experience several times. And when he's turning the wheel, his prefrontal cortex activates and dampens down the stress response. And he goes into coping mode. And after a while, you can't stress this rat. Even if you disconnect the wheel, you can't stress him because he's learned, I can control stressful situations. Rat B, Tail gets shocked, turns the wheel, nothing happens. 
Rat B becomes a nervous wreck who's, who's constantly stressed because he didn't have that sense of control that, he, that says that I can control stressful situations. And Mayer says, and, and so many people in psychology support this idea, that that sense of control inoculates you from the harmful effects of stress. And the, the, Ned and I have been working with a lot of families the last few months about how do we use this experience of COVID to help us to, to become more comfortable with unpredictability and the novelty of it. And, and so that we are, how do we feel and like focus on get a sense of control and be clear about the stuff we can't control, but also how do we focus on the stuff we can control? And we think about this in two dimensions. What one is the sense of control in two dimensions. One is subjective sense of agency or autonomy. Yeah, this is my life. And the other is the brain state that supports that where the prefrontal cortex, the most recently evolved part of the brain, that can actually think and can go into the future and put things in perspective and calm yourself down once you start to get upset. The prefrontal cortex regulates the rest of the brain, including the amygdala. And so it's that when you're in your right mind and your prefrontal cortex is regulating the rest of your brain, you're focused, you're engaged, you have a sense of control. When you don't, you tend to, you can be anxious, you can, you can be, you can be overwhelmed, or you can have that feeling of helplessness, of hopelessness, of, of just resigned, of, of, of not having a sense of control. So it's that sense of agency, and it's the neurological state that supports it. And what our concern about from the mental health point of view is that so many kids are growing up so that they're, where they're just tired and stressed most of the time, which changes the brain in a way that makes them more vulnerable to being easily stressed, anxious, and, and, and eventually getting depressed. And many of the families that we work with, many of the kids that we work with, seem to have the idea that the most important outcome of their childhood and adolescence is where they go to college. And Ned and I feel the most important outcome isn't where they go to college. It's the brain that they're developing, the brain that they're sculpting, that they'll carry into adult life. And we want, ki we want kids to be as successful as they can possibly be. But we also want them to be able to enjoy, be able to enjoy their success. So we want them to pursue success in a way that's sustainable, in a way that really cultures a healthy brain, so that they can be very successful in adults, and and not and still be able to enjoy it, and not and not be able to not have the experience of, so what? I'm, I'm depressed no matter what I do. I'm not going to enjoy it. So we want we want the sustainable approach to developing a healthy brain, so kids can enjoy their success. Ed, you want to. Take over? Sure. Yeah, I, Bill. I think it's all terrific points. You know, and one of the challenges, of course, you know, since, since when we were last uh, with with their lovely community, is this this little virus you might have heard about. It's been in the news for a while, uh, and in many ways, it's kind of you know, it's kind of changed. Uh, it's added an entire level or possibly levels of concern and stress, and, and the novelty, unpredictability, threat, and, and low sense of control. And but still, you know, we as parents, we as educators, kids as students are still trying to figure out how to how to move forward. And, you know, taking a, a little bit of a step back from school, you know, as much as we all have plans for where we want our kids to end up educationally and in life, I think at least for the short term, the most important outcome of getting through this global pandemic virus is getting through it in ways where we are as psychologically whole as we can be because, and this is really important because, you know, for a lot of parents, particularly if you have younger kids, you may have kids who really, they want to do anything in the world except for the learning that's in front of them. And, and I'll talk about why in just a moment from a motivational perspective. And, and we as parents start to get so anxious and so worried if they, if they don't do this, if they don't learn it now, will they ever catch up? If they don't learn this, if their grades are bad now, I mean, my goodness. And there, there's really nothing that kids learn, that, there's nothing that kids don't learn now that they can't learn later. And, and actually the research shows that about 90% of what kids learn, they, they kind of forget anyway. So if we had to put our finger on something as the more important thing to focus on, it really would be helping kids even more so than ever develop in ways that are psychologically sound. And if I take a, a moment from Bill talking about the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala, the single best predictor, the single best marker of mental health is how strong are those connections between the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala? When something intense happens, how strong are those connections? So the, the, the rational problem solving, put things in perspective part of your brain can go, oh, 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 we've got a solution to that. 
And that's the, what we really want is the outcome for all of our kids. And particularly during this pandemic, that that wiring is as strong as it can be because life is pretty intense right now. And when we think about resilience, it's kind of helpful to remind ourselves that the definition of resilience is nothing more than the ability to return to a previous shape. So we hope to a previous form. So we hope that, you know, our economy and our country and our cultures and our communities are resilient and we'll be able to bounce back on the other side of this terrible virus in ways that we can, we can get back as much as many of the things that we feel like have lost, we can get them back. For our kids, that resilience is, as Bill said, the ability to say, I can handle this. This is hard now, but I'm, but I'm gonna get there. So let me talk about motivation for a moment and why the sense of autonomy is so important. Again, for all the parents who see their kids, you know, trying, trying to get their kids to do the work, trying to get them to be on Zoom, I would submit, and I have a daughter who's a junior in high school right now, that the most important thing we should be focusing on in school, our, our, our prime directive is not, is not wanting our kids to work hard. It should be wanting them to want to work hard. Not that they'll do the work, but that they want to do the work. Right, because there's a very different thing of doing it with carrots and sticks versus saying, as Bill said, I'm, I'm trying to develop myself. I'm trying to get better as a writer. I'm trying to really master math, whatever it happens to be. And for anyone who's been stuck, you know, going back and forth between carrots and sticks, threats and threats and rewards, there actually is a solution to this. Whew, thank goodness, some good news, right? And it's called self-determination theory. So self-determination theory is a model of inner motivation of saying, this matters to me, I'm gonna work hard at this, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get at this. And to have this inner drive, people need three things. We need a sense of competency. If you feel like you're the worst kid in math, you don't wanna work hard to get better, you don't wanna do it at all, right? You need a sense of relatedness. And this is the thing that's really hard right now with COVID is the real secret sauce of every good teacher is palling around or finding friends or noticing the sensitivity or paying attention to what's harder, the favorite sport team or whatever of all of her kids, right? And then the last thing is, is autonomy, that I, I won't work hard for other people's goals the way that I work hard for me. I need to feel like I have some input on this. And importantly, competency, relatedness and autonomy, to get this to work well, it's a three-legged stool and these things have to be in balance. But if you kind of carve off two and make one really long, it's not a stool, it's something that just falls over. And the challenge is so often as parents, we think most, because we think most about the competency because that's what we can see. But it's so important for us to know that from a neurological level, from a neurochemical level, that sense of wanting to do things is tied to all three of those. And so really we wanna make sure that we're doing everything we can to preserve our relationships with our kids, relatedness, foster those and support their autonomy because over time we're trying to wire them so that they wanna work hard. And then two other quick things on motivation. I know we, we got a lot to cover here and we wanna to get to questions at the end. People probably know, because you're all parts of the, the parent education series, probably know all about the wonderful work of Carol Dweck and the book of mindsets. And for us, that idea of a growth mindset is a sense of control that, you know, I, I'm, I'm terrible at this. Well, chances are that if you want to work harder at this, and you, you may not want to, and that's okay, but, but, I, but there's nothing that suggests that you're stuck where you are now, that all skills in everything you can pick up, pick, think of, they're developable. Is there anything we don't get better at with practice? And that gives kids a choice. They may want to work hard, they may not want to work hard. But knowing that I'm not stuck where I am makes it much easier and really supports that, that, that inner drive that we're talking about. And then I'm going to kick it back to Bill for a moment um, to talk about the, the idea of flow. Because right now with so much of school disrupted and so many activities disrupted, but with this constant focus on helping our kids develop themselves, including developing their inner motivation. There are things other than school that we can focus on that help us get that outcome of a, of a, of a self-driven brain that we want in our self-driven kids. Well, this, uh, this experience of flow that you're alluding to, to here, yeah, this experience of, of complete absorption in whether you're playing, and we, we get as adults, we get it playing tennis with somebody who's equally as good as where we have to give our full effort. We get it at work when we're deeply engaged in a problem or we're playing music with other people where we have to be completely focused. And we're in this brain state that's combining high energy, high attention, high effort, high determination, and low stress. And 
kids have this kind of experience from when they're playing with Legos, when, when, they're, when they're engaged in sports or drama or music or art, when they're completely in, in fully engaged. And there's a guy named Reed Larson who studies adolescent development, who concluded a few years ago that, that kids don't turn into self-motivated adolescents and adults primarily by doing their homework dutifully. It's through what he called the passionate pursuit of pastime. That, that with a three-year-old building Legos, completely absorbed, trying to get better and better. That's the experience that, that builds the, the, the connections in the brain that, that of that brain state of high energy, high focus, high determination, high, high effort, but low stress. And that's where we want to be most of the time. And, and I think Ned threw it back to me because I, I had a 2.8 grade point average in high school when I graduated. And, and I did very little homework. I, I, I never turned anything on time. And, but I was a passionate rock and roll guy. And I, I, I spent two or three hours every night uh, working on my, my music and did little study. And I really think when I read this, this research of Red, Reed Larson, it made sense to me because I felt like I sculpted my a, a brain playing rock and roll. The once, once school became more important to me when I went to college, I could go pedal to the metal. I could be really focused. And so when I work with kids now who aren't that motivated for school, that I, I say, if they're long, they're, they're really passionately involved in something. And video games may not count. I should be happy to take a question about that later. But anything else, I say, I don't worry about you because I know that you're sculpting a your brain that's going to be able to go to the pedal to the metal when school gets more important to you. Now, um, so th these are the two main reasons that, that Ned and I wrote The Self-Driven Child, th these concerns about the stress-related mental health problems and the relationship between a low, in relation to a low sense of control. And also these motivational difficulties and the relationship to a lack of autonomy. And so let's talk about some of the stuff that we, we, we recommend to, to parents that are, I think are particularly useful in this current time of crisis. And so the first idea is that we, we, we believe in that, that certainly as kids get a little bit older, you start to think of yourself more as a consultant to your kid than your kid's manager or boss or taskmaster or distance learning police. And this, this kind of this idea came out of experiences I had early in my career where I'd work with kids who um, underachievers and I'd say, if you don't turn an assignment, who's most upset? They'd say my mom, then my dad, then my, then my teacher, then my tutor, then my therapist. The kid was never on the list. And I'd, I'd go to school meetings and, I'd, 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 and a learning specialist would say, it, it, takes, it takes two learning specialists and a tutor and the parent on top of this kid all the time to get him to do any work. And I'd say stop immediately because this will never change until the energy changes. If the adults are spending 80 units of energy trying to get the kid to work, the kid will spend 20. And, and also, I, so many families just over my career have said, I hate dinner time because after dinner time, it's three hours of World War III fighting about my kids' homework. And so what, what we suggest in the book is you say, I love you too much to fight with you about your homework. And you can substitute your distance learning as well. I, sub, I love you too much to fight with you about your homework. And then you say, I'm willing to do whatever I can to help you. I'm willing to be your homework consultant. I'm, I'm willing to sit with you for prescribed time. I'm willing to, to, to help you figure out what you need to do. I'm willing to try to find help if you need help. But you're the most precious thing in the universe to me. I don't want to fight with you about it all the time. And, and I don't want to act like somehow it's my job. I couldn't make you do it. You could just flop to the floor. I couldn't make you learn. I couldn't make you focus on this. And so we take this idea of, of, of thinking about ourselves more as a consultant than as the, the kid's boss or manager. And there's very quickly, there's four implications of this idea. One is that we offer help to kids rather than trying to force it on them. And most of the kids that I evaluate, they need help. They need tutoring or they need a speech and language pathologist or they need therapy or they need, they need something, special education. I don't believe in, unless kids are wildly out of control, I don't believe in trying to force help on, on them because they just fight it. And I don't want kids spending their energy fighting our attempts to help them. Secondly, we offer our advice and our wisdom and our experience to kids when they're open to it, but we don't try to force it down their throat. One of my favorite cartoons, Ned has this cartoon, dad's holding his two sons by the nape of the neck. He says, listen up boys and listen up good because I'm willing to tell you this a million times. You know, and so many parents say, you know, I, I keep telling them, I keep trying to get them to see. And what we suggest is offer. Say, say you know, I, I've got a thought about that. Would you like to hear it? Is there a way that I could help? 
I wonder, I wonder what would happen if you did it this way, where we, did, we look for buy-in rather than trying to ram stuff down kids' throats. And thir the third thing is that where possible, we want kids to make their own decisions. And when they're very little, we give them choices and, and say, do you want to do it this way or this way? And as they get older, we want to encourage them to make decisions, informed decisions where they talk with us and they talk with other people who know more than they do so they can actually think about things in, in a way that allows them to make a good informed decision. And, as, and we feel that, that with teenagers, the best message you can give a teenager besides I love you is I'm confident in your ability to make decisions about your own life and to learn from your mistakes. And I want you to have a ton of experience doing that before I send you off to college. So, and, and we know that even pretty young kids, if we help them think through the pros and cons, are capable of making good decisions for themselves. And the fourth thing, the fourth implication of this parent is consultant idea is if you got a kid who is really struggling with distance learning, you got a kid who just got unfriended by, 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 by his friends or didn't get invited to a virtual birthday party, that you ask yourself, whose problem is it? Because our, our instinct, the way we're wired as mammals, when our kids are suffering, we want to try to solve it for them. But we know the way we become resilient is by dealing with some, something stressful happens. We activate the, the prefrontal cortex which dampens down the stress response, so we go into coping mode. And we don't want to deprive kids of that, that experience of having to deal with their own problems. So we ask ourselves, whose problem is it? And remember, it's my, and I can offer to help. I wonder if there's a way that I could help, or we can brainstorm. But if we leap in and try to solve the problem for the kid, we deprive them of that experience, that fundamental experience that, that helps them build high stress tolerance, the ability to function well under stress, and builds that resilience, as Ned said, that ability to bounce back. Ned, do you want to? Yeah, what I, I would I would I would echo um, Bill's talk about. If you remember Rat A and Rat B, there was a really clever uh, variation that Mayer and his colleagues did, where um, they had Rat A and Rat B, and Rat A had the wheel that worked. Rat B was actually yoked to Rat A, so when Rat A spun the wheel, he saved himself and he saved Rat B but it didn't help Rat B. This, the act of being saved, he ended up being just as friggin' neurotic as before. He was safe now, but he had no, he had no experience of being able to save himself. And this is really important when we think about being consultants, because one of the real challenges we face right now as parents is we are seeing everything at home that our kids are doing at school, or let's be honest, we're seeing everything that our kids are not doing at home for school which is, can be, depending on how you're wired, can be crazy making because you get so anxious. You get so anxious and we find ourselves not being the consultant, but being the manager. Shouldn't you be, shouldn't you be, shouldn't you be? I had a conversation with a, a kid I've worked with about a year ago whose parents had come to book talk and I, and I saw him, straight A student at Sidwell Friends. And this is about as academic as you get in our corner of the world. And I asked him, did your parents read the book? Yeah, I think they did. Did it make any difference for you? Well, yeah. They've stopped asking me, shouldn't you be doing your homework? And I'm like, yes. And I said, well, how has that made a difference for you? And he said, well, honest to gosh, every time they say, shouldn't you be doing your homework? It just made me not want to do my homework. And this was a kid who was already getting straight A's. He was already driven, but his parents maybe wanted to help, maybe wanted to lower their own stress. We're wiping out his autonomy and screwing up the relatedness and therefore the intrinsic motivation that they already had. And I say this, understanding how hard it is when your kids are not doing well in school, when your kids are not doing the work. I have a daughter who's a junior in high school. When she was in eighth grade, she was full school refusal with anxiety and depression, did nothing for three months. So I know what this feels like, but I want to remind you, as I have to remind myself all the time, that she too wants her life to work out. She does. She wants to be successful. She may do it in ways that are imperfect because who doesn't do things imperfectly before they learn to do them perfectly. And her goals and my goals, what she may be motivated for right now might not be what I wanted to be motivated for, but I, I have to stay this, I have to stay in my own lane and play this consultative role as best I can. There's wonderful research from kind of out your side of the country, a woman named Jesse Burrell in UC Irvine who did this great experiment with kids. And it was, you love this since it's all digital now, it was kids doing a digital puzzle and by design, it was really hard. They're like 12, 13 year olds and they had to get the things together or whatever. And they had their moms there with them. And mom was just there for moral support. And the only instruction to mom was, 
don't, don't, don't tell them how to do it. Don't tell them, don't give them instructions. You can offer encouragement. Don't tell them what to do. That, that was the only instruction. And mom had a heart rate monitor on her and the kid had a heart rate monitor on her. And then they kind of watched what happened. Well, by design, the puzzle was, if not impossible, really hard. And the kids got frustrated as they do. And as the kids got frustrated, it was distressing to moms. And they could see their both heart rates going up and up and up. And eventually every single mom couldn't help herself. But you know, sweetheart, put it over here, try turning it this way because she wanted to help. She didn't want her kids to suffer. And as she jumped in to help, her heart rate monitor went down, down, down. She felt better. She was no longer helpless. She wasn't on the sideline, but her kids went up. So this is hard and I don't want to give everyone a hard time, but it is to recognize that the reason so often we jump in to do things for our kids is simply because we love them. We're mammals, we're supposed to, right? But what may feel like the right idea actually is kind of a problem because you go back to rat A and rat B, rat A saved rat B and I'm sure rat B was happy as all get out, but the long, short-term not getting shocked, long-term a nervous wreck. So if I can, can I pivot in towards being a non-anxious presence bell? Please do. So there's a chapter in a book called A Non-Anxious Presence, which sounds like a farcical idea in this world. I get that. But it was a whole body of literature that basically had, they do all this thing with another group of rats. And they use rats because they can do mean things to rats. The rats have brains that are similar to people. So they basically had baby rats and they whisked them away from the day they were born. And then they kind of mistreated them and freaked them out. If they gave them back to mom, and mom was a high licking and grooming rat, which is kind of the radical of it. The stress flows were flew, flowed right out of their little brains. And they were like, oh, thank goodness. And the, in this study, they went back and forth, stressed them out, oh my goodness, to, oh, thank goodness, back and forth and back and forth until the rat pups reached maturity. And then they looked at the brains and they had that beautiful connection that Bill and I were talking about of the prefrontal cortex handled the stress response. And in this case, mom didn't jump in and do the homework, solve them, hire a neuropsychologist, get a test prep two to prepare them for the SCT. Nope, all she did was say is, you know, basically they're there, there. And so we feel strongly that home should feel like a safe base. When you go out and the soccer game is intense, your friends treat you badly, you're in bomb and test, or you're at work and things don't go well. Don't you want to go home and have your spouse be saying, that sounds like a hard day. Can I, is there a way that I can help? What's hard right now is we're all kind of at home and seeing everything. And so we don't really have these different spheres of school and life. And it turns out that, that, that both stress, stress is contagious and so is calm. And so a couple points to take out of this are that one, one of the ways that we can help our kids is just by taking care of ourselves. And we feel like we wanna jump in and be like the digital people and telling kids what to do where if we can take care of ourselves and prioritize our own mental health, our happiness, our sleep, our exercise, neurologically, when we bring our temperature down, it brings down the temperature of people around us. Now, some people, this is easier to do depending on what's going on in their lives and job, and some people it's harder. And some people are kind of built this way. They're just kind of naturally a little more non-anxious and some of people are a little bit more fretful. So the other two pieces of advice that I would offer are that one, we wanna take the long view. Because when your kid is having a really hard time, your fears aren't really about today. They're about the bad places you think it's gonna go. And Bill, more than anyone, is you know, 37 years as a clinical neuropsychologist has seen all of these kids who were just struggling as all get out. They're a hot mess, right? And, and you can tell you, they don't get stuck that way. We were at a talk at an independent school a couple of years ago and a mom who Bill hadn't seen in 10 years stood up and she said, my son was the most learning disabled school at the dominant school at the most, at the school in DC for the most learning disabled kids. Okay. He was just every, everything was hard. She said, he's now a junior at the University of Maryland and he's studying engineering and he's doing great. And he, I'm sure it's a learning, it's fraught with learning disabilities. And so he had to work and struggle and work and struggle. And I'm sure his mom gave him more scaffolding you can possibly imagine. But just like with lifting weights, we don't want to do the all too much lifting for our kids because they don't get stronger. They need to have the sense that I'm building my strengths. I'm getting there. So if you have a kid who's struggling now, again, remain confident that long term, long term, maybe not this week, maybe not this month, maybe not this year, they want to be successful. And if you could, if you could put the idea in your head 
that what your kid is struggling with right now is just part of her path. My daughter's a junior in high school, doing great, eighth grade, ninth grade. It's been a long process. If you take the long view, it makes it much easier not to worry about today, including this ridiculous virus. And secondly, if you don't know what else to do, put it on your calendar that three times a week, you're gonna sit there and stare at your kid and just act like, even if they're a hot mess, that they're the most joy creating thing, if not in the universe, then at least in the room. And gosh, I just, aren't you just the best? And find something to love about them because at a neurochemical level, increases your oxytocin, their serotonin, brings everyone's cortisol down and creates these bonds. That, and hey, we're back to that relatedness piece that fosters their motivation and puts them in a position where their brain works better and they can solve their own problems and motivate to solve their own problems and get that wiring that Rat Bean never got. Can I add a couple of things, my friend? I would love to hear what you have to offer. So, I mean, the, 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 over my career, ma many times I've been talking with a family and they've been telling me about a kid's problems. And, and, and one of the parents, sometimes the dad, sometimes the mom, will break into tears and say, I just want him to feel good about himself. And what I do is, is I sit and, and I wait till they calm down. And then I say, I think we can more convincingly help him feel good about himself if we aren't worried sick. And many parents that I'm talking with you in the, in the last six months are, feel very badly for their kids. They feel that their kids are socially isolated. Certainly one of the psychiatrists I work with says, I've never written more prescriptions for Zoloft than I have in the, in the last three or four months. And yet we don't want to feel sorry for our kids in, in part because we don't want them to feel sorry for themselves. I mean, self-pity never gets any, and we, what we want, we want to be, have empathy for them. And we, we want to help them try to understand their experience. And we, we, we want to let them know we understand, but we also understand, that, let them know that we don't feel sorry for them because we see this as part of their path. And this is from this is part of our own path. This is, this is what the universe is dealing is, is dealing with us, and that we can grow from it, even even though it's hard. And I think that message is a useful message for kids. And I just just go back to taking the long view. Yet. I mean, I just got I got, I got a Christmas card this year from a family. The, the, the front of it said, "You were right." And it's from a family where I followed three kids for many years, but I haven't seen any of them for at least ten years. And the point I opened it up is, and said they all turned out great. And all these kids were a hot mess at some point in their life. And one's become a, a, an attorney on Capitol Hill. One's an engineer. One has her own graphic design business. The picture included them, all three kids and their spouses. They said they're happily married, they're great kids. And this happens, in my experience, thousands of times. And so kids are going, can go, be going through hard times. And, and we don't have to feel sorry for them. We want to have empathy. But we also want to recognize that that's the way you become resilient. If kids never deal with anything hard, they don't develop that resilience reflex. And the last thing I want to say is that my favorite cartoon of all time is, is about it. It features a dad who is not a non anxious presence. And two kids are walking, they're two teenage boys, and one says, God, I'm so sick of my dad. He's constantly on my back about my schoolwork. He's constantly telling me, get those grades up. Last night I couldn't take it anymore. I said, get that salary up. <laughs> so you know there's two other ideas in, in the book that, that we should mention that i think one is this idea of radical downtime do you, you want to talk a little bit about it yeah so there, there's a lot to be said about this but but principally i mean people may have been seeing the 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 documentary the social dilemma and it, it's simply the idea that most of us are way too wired both kids and parents. And this research shows parents are just as bad as kids for what it's worth. And we, we, we have too much time on screens, we have too much technology, and then all of which have the sum total of, of, of stealing our attention, of fragmenting our attention and making life feel like it's going faster and faster and faster. And those same things, we, we, we go to those to games and social media and, and update on, on you know, the news about the election, whatever, because it, it's stimulating, but it's also stressful. And the long-term effects of, of having too much of that stress are, are pretty, pretty bad. And we, and we feel that the, the pace of the world, particularly with all the technology and you know, your car in the world more than any place else, that things have gone so fast that to find balance, we simply need to have more time in our lives when we describe what we describe as radical digital downtime. And so this includes things like having by design times in our life, day, times in our day, when we can, when we can daydream, 
when we can mind wander, when we can walk in a park, we leave our phone by design at home. When we do meditation, both mindfulness and, and transcendental meditation, Bill and Bill's been a practicing practitioner of TM for 46 years. I've been doing this for about a decade. And you know, for us, that's a heck of a really good investment for people to realize that all of us have this deep, deep sense of calm in us and we just need to know how to access it. There are far too many kids that I work with who I, I they, 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 they describe themselves as not being anxious because their default resting state is one of anxiety. And they, they haven't yet experienced what it feels like to be fully rested. And so we feel that as, as parents, and, and honest to gosh, you, you can't make a kid do this, just like you can't make a kid fall asleep, but we want to model it. And we want to practice this ourselves, like I was saying before about, you know, if we prioritize our sleep and exercise and things like meditation, that we need this to balance out because the, the people who make all this technology, they're not going to stop, right? They're, they're, they always have something new for us to use. And, and it's okay for us to use those things so long as they are in balance. And for us, the way to balance that out is to have times in our day for TM, at least 20 minutes, twice a day, you know, forever, right? And that radical digital downtime rewires our brain in part because it activates something called the default mode network, which is this really neat thing where um, for years when they put people in functional MRIs and see what part of their brain lit up if they, you know, if they hummed or did math or whatever. And it kind of assumed that when people weren't doing anything, their brain was kind of quiet. Well, it turns out that was wrong. And when we aren't actively involved in another task, this, def this default mode network activates. It actually uses 70% of our brain and what it fosters is things like a sense of empathy, thinking about our past and our future, developing a coherent sense of identity. And particularly for adolescents, what could be more valuable than developing a coherent sense of yourself? And so we just worry that we have kids who are overstimulated by technology and overly programmed, particularly pre-COVID, by things that they should be doing. Uh, and the, the, the person who wrote this wonderful article had the, simply the title, Rest is not idleness. And it's something that we think, we think that everyone should be taken more seriously, that rest is actually the basis of all human activity. And, and we, we, when we wrote the, the self-driven child, I mean, pre-COVID, we're still, we're really concerned about the, the out of balance relationship between rest and activity, as, as Ned was saying. And, and now we're, we're kids are engaged in technology e even more. And it's not that we, it's not we can you know, set the same kind of screen screen time limits that we, we could before, but still, what we want to be doing is recognizing that, that the brain needs breaks. Every, this default mode that Ned, Ned mentioned, every time you blink your eyes, it, it activates the default mode, and we want kids to know that they, they, they do this stuff for a while, but get away from it. Close your eyes for a few minutes. Put your head between your legs and get blood flow to your head. And and the, the radical downtime is the stuff that that where it looks like you're doing nothing, you're just daydreaming or you're meditating. And I've done, I, I've done studies of, of, of kids, middle school kids of medit doing meditation and it's with ADHD and it's helped them a lot. They get much less anxious, they get better focus. This one kid in one of our studies who's wildly impulsive, um, we asked him, what, what did you notice from meditating in school twice a day for three months? And he said, before I started meditating, if I was walking in the hall and somebody bumped me, I just turn around and hit him. But now if I'm meditating, if I'm walking in the hall and somebody bumps me, I stop and think, should I hit him or not? And another kid with autism, uh, he and his mother learned together, he learned transcendental meditation. And he was asked, what do you notice from meditating? He says, it calms the mind and it calms the mom. And making her more of a yeah. non presence. And, uh, and, and, and the last thing, if I may jump in uh, about radical downtime is sleep. I cannot tell you how many thousands of hours of test prep I've been paid to do that I allocate to talking about sleep. I literally, before I started this uh, uh, presentation with you, a conversation with you guys, I was uh, working with a kid who's taking the GMAT for business school. So he's a Harvard grad, uh, wants to go back to HBS or Stanford or whatever, whatever business school, um, and was talking about how he's having a hard time this test and he, and he gets stuck on a question, he kind of can't let it go in, and, and, and all of which looks to me like a little perfectionistic, a little bit of stress, you know, stress-induced behavior. And so we started going that way. And I eventually brought him around to sleep because I always do. And he admitted that when he, he, he's now going to want to go to business school, he started a very successful startup. 
And he said, for three years, all I did was work with that. And I let everything slide. And I said, I, and I know, he said, I got really depressed. I got really depressed, you know, after we got our fund financing and da, 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 because I didn't have the drive of that anymore. And I said, well, actually what I think happened was is that same excitement that you put yourself under of the anticipation of we're going to get funding, we're going to make this successful, I'm going to be a big deal, all of which is super exciting. That same thing that drove you to be so successful was the same thing neurologically that made you become depressed. And so this kid was a college rower. He's an athlete, right? And, but he said, I asked him, have you been exercising? Well, I really fell away from that. And, I, and, I, and I'm not a good sleeper. So his homework is to go four days of getting eight hours of sleep and going out and go off with his girlfriend and go run a couple miles every day. And I am confident that his running every day for a couple miles and getting eight hours of sleep will do more than anything that I can teach him about the GMAT, though eventually we'll get around to that. And so for anyone, who, I mean, simply put in the, in the world that we're in right now, we all have more inputs of stress. Even if nothing else in your life changes, just the stress contagion of what's going on around us. And if we have more inflows of stress, we have to work harder at the outflows of stress. Otherwise things will become unbalanced and we'll feel depressed or anxious and we, we can't even figure out why because it doesn't have to be a cause. It can just be chemistry. Well, let, let's, let's take two minutes, Ned, and just talk about the, one of the last ideas in the book, and then we'll uh, turn it over to Charlene and, and uh, take questions. So the, the last main idea in, in our book is that so many of the kids that we see don't have an accurate model of reality. The, 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 the kids in our area have the idea that it's Yale or jail. I mean, a lot, a lot of the kids do, and, and they think that the, the valedictorians are going to be the most successful people. And there's so much research suggests. When we, when we were out in your corner last, last year, Bill Ted made that point, and, and one of the superintendents in school said, actually, the kids here say it's Yale or jail. And an hour later, our phones blew up with, with Rick Singer and Varsity Blues. And apparently, apparently it wasn't an or, it's an and. You'll go to Yale and I'll go to jail. Anyway, back to you, Bill. <laughs> it, did work out like, it, it did work out like that, my friend. But yeah. But, uh, but the idea is, is that that so many kids, I, I see so many kids who are discouraged and kids in high school who, who aren't doing well and they think they'd screw up their whole life. And the first thing I tell them is you could flunk every single one of your, your, your high school classes. You could go to community college then if you decided that was a bad idea. And you could get 30 credits and apply to most of the colleges in the country without having to show your high school transcript. And when I tell kids, I give them an accurate model of reality, it motivates them to work hard. I see kids who are doing nothing because they figure, what's the point? Leap into action. And it's not that we don't want kids to, to, to go to elite schools. If that's what they want to do, go for it. But we don't. But there's so much of mental health is changing. I, I have to to I want to. And so many kids grow, growing up, I think that I have to do this or this or this on a certain time scale. If I ever get off the track, I'll never be successful. And we want kids to understand how many ways there are for, to be successful in this world. There are many late bloomers in this world. There's a lot of opportunities. And um, I just try to get them a little bit more kind of grounded in, in, in the way that the real world is, as opposed to this idea that it's only the, the top 5% of the student body that's going to be successful. Ed, you want to finish off? Yeah, and really quick, and just 10 seconds to add to that, that same Sonia Lupian who put forth the nuts of what stresses us out, says that arguably the single best way, the single best thinking to counteract that crazy making nuts is to have a plan B. So as Bill points out, we want every single kid here, all your children, to be as educated and successful as they can be. Because it's good for them, right? To, to, be, to be as educated and develop their talents. It's good for them, it's good for families, it's good for communities, it's good for, it's good for a whole bloody country. But as, as Bill said before, we want them to do it in a way that's healthy. Because all you have to do is think back the last two or three years of all these ridiculously successful people who took their own lives. Because depression, doesn't give a fig about career success. Wealth and success do not protect you against depression. Things that support mental health support you against, against depression. And so our book, look, I'm a person who helps people get into college and I principally help them do better on tests by actually doing things that support their mental health. And so I just don't want anyone to come away thinking this is an either or proposition. And the last thing I'll just, I'll, I'll end with where we end our book that, you know, I mean, I have a kid who's a, who's a freshman in college and, and we, as parents, we, we, we all know that so many of the things we do for our, our kids, to, they, they, they kind of half forget them and, they, and they'll forget so much of what we say. But what does get wired into their brains is how we make them feel. 
and the things for us that we think support kids developing successful and healthy lives are obviously that they feel loved, back to that relatedness, that they feel supported, which is different from being pushed, right? It's supported, not that they feel trusted and they feel capable. And with those things, they have that connection with us, but they have within them the sense that I can navigate the world and set worthy goals for myself and go forward and achieve them in ways that will make me successful and develop a life that, 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 that I wanna live. So Charlene, I'll say again, we are always so grateful for the work that you do and, and delighted to be among the many wonderful people that you bring to the community here. Uh, and, and thank you, of course, to all the sponsors who make this uh, happen. Um, we look forward to being in California again because boy, you guys occupy a, a wonderful corner of the world, but for now we're happy to be doing this, at least virtually. In our minds, we're in California. So. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a song, isn't there, Bill? Yep, yep. Like California in your mind. <laughs> yep. You know, I love that you ended on such a positive note because the questions coming in from you parents are wonderful and heartbreaking and difficult. So I want to share some of them just to get started. But first of all, I want to say there's a wonderful educator in our community named Mary Dunn. And Mary runs the independent um, learning community of students, which was large 10 years ago and now is growing. But what she says is no child comes to school to fail. And I think you've just so nicely showed us that every kid wants to do well. We parents want our kids to do well. The kids want to do well. But this autonomy is something that can get in their way. And it's difficult for parents to understand the balance. So let's start with a few questions around sort of that side, kids who are having trouble being motivated. Here's a parent who asks, what happens if you have a kid who's not passionate about anything? Well, <laughs> I, 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 have a, I have two granddaughters. One is seven and one, one, one just turned five. And the seven-year-old is completely self-driven. She's completely passionate about gymnastics. She'll, she, she loves four-hour practices. She's seven years old. She loves it when her coach corrects her and, and, and gets to do her better. Her, her five-year-old sister, the, the, her mother was saying, uh, uh, maybe, maybe you'd like to uh, uh, get into acting and be on, on stage. She said, do you, you think you'd like to be in a, a play? And the five-year-old said, I don't think so. And her mom said, why not? She said, it's not like a lot of work, you know, and, and, and I, I, I'm not worried. I'm not worried at all about the fact that she hasn't found something that, that she's passionate about. And, and many of my clients don't don't find something they're really passionate until, until they're quite a bit older, oftentimes in young adulthood. And it's not it's not necessary. It's great when kids do, but but it, it's not necessary. And ideally, we, we expose kids to stuff that, that they, we think that they may like and that they may. And, and we talk to them a little bit about the value of working hard to get better and better and better at something that's important to you and in terms of the way that develops the brain. But we can't force it. But we don't have to we don't have to worry that somehow if our kids don't have a passion now, they'll never get it. I just see that I just seen the opposite of that so many times. Ned, do you want to? Yeah, and part of that is, you know, at the age, if your kid is school age, particularly middle school or high school, they, they kind of get the message that the, the legitimate things to be passionate about include school uh, and soccer, um, violin, you know, coding, you know, a very limited set of things. And if their if their interests fall out of that, they may be getting these these not so subtle or not so subtle messages from their peers or their teachers or whatever. That's kind of a waste of time, right? And so it can be sometimes hard for them. They may they, your 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 son or daughter may have this this initial curiosity, but may feel like that kind of that's not going to meet with approval because I've seen some comments over there that we, we feel like all around us we we as parents get these messages we have to direct our kids in certain ways. The thing for for me, I would simply is in, in a gentle way and in as authentic a way as possible try to foster your kids' curiosity, which can simply be by taking, be taking some curiosity in the things that they're doing. Like, you know, because this will get into the, the, about screen times. My daughter has right now been playing this game called Among Us, which people may, may know is sort of like mafia with cartoon characters in space. The whole thing's really silly, but there's a bunch of strategy and it's, it's understanding people. And, you know, there are kids who are motivated by nothing more than their friends. But people who are like that are likely to develop careers where their great skill in life is figuring out how other people work that maybe makes them, I don't know, 
a good neuropsychologist or a better than average test prep tutor or a client of mine who's the head of all HR for a Fortune 100 company, right? She's not there for a technical genius, but she understands people better than, you know, at, at, a, at, a, at a black belt level. And so from my perspective, you try to pay attention to where are kids spending their time and what are they interested in and try to just, you know, try to be, be, take curiosity. So what, tell me how that works. That's pretty neat. And, and if it's if it feels like it's a small number, it's not passionate. We, we don't want to like show too, too much, but just that's kind of neat that you do that and sort of step away and, and see if you can foster that a little bit by by validating the things that your kid seems to be at least a little bit interested in. And I'll, I'll just because kind of, when, when 30 seconds, which is simply that in my experience, what happens is that so often there's so many influences on a kid's life. And often as parents, we think that we need to help find a passion. But so often it's a friend or it's a teacher or a new coach or somebody who just moved, somebody new to the school that turns them on to something or finds some, 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 some spark in them. Says, I see this in you and, and the kid becomes passionate. So we don't have to work. Well, and I, I also would like to refer you parents to our friend, Dr. Iran McGinn, who Bill and Ned have spoken with. He's a wonderful um, educator around parent-child and parent-teen communication. And he did a little workshop for us last week that is on our video library called How to Be Your Child's Favorite Conversation Partner. And what Bill and Ned are talking about here is how do you open the conversation to find out more about what your kids are interested in? And mostly that just means listen. Oh, parents, that's really good advice. Okay, and check out that video. Um, here is a really good question and not an easy one. Do you suggest parents should implement consequences or expectations? For example, you can't play video games until after you've done your homework. Or do you just let them be and let them learn the hard way? We're fans of what's called authoritative parenting, as opposed to authoritarian or laissez-faire. So that that it's important for us to to, to set limits. And, and but but ideally, we work out the limits with kids. And so, so often um, that we 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 would say well, you need to do this or this or this, and the kid bucks us. But if if we really if we start with empathy and understanding what the kids kids perspective. And then we tell them our perspective and we do engage in this kind of collaborative problem solving to figure out what, what, what would be the best time to do homework and what happens if you, if you play video games first. It, 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 my guess is that, that a lot of times that everything else is, is boring after that. It's hard to focus. And, and so, so we, we try to work out something that you can live with and I can live with. And we, uh, certainly we support parents in saying stuff like, I can't live with myself. If I know that, that, you're, that you're just avoiding all the things that you really should need to be doing to, to develop yourself, to play video games. And, we, and I, I can't live with that. And the parents don't want their parents, kids don't want their parents to have that experience of, I can't live with myself. So th th we, we're big fans of this kind of collaborative problem solving. So that we work out limits and we work out consequences ahead of the time with, with the kids. Ned, do you want to add? Yeah, the, the, exactly then. The other the, the kind of thought is strike when the iron is cold. Okay, don't have that conversation about the completely unbalanced, bonkers, unhinged use of technology da, 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 when the kid is using technology because you're not going to be effective and the kid is going to bat away oftentimes the great advice that you have to share. And so, because if, if you feel impatient with your kid, your kid's going to feel it too. And teenagers, adolescents, especially, teenagers especially, are incredibly good at picking up on their parent and other people's emotions, but they're terrible at explaining it. And so they tend to, their amygdala is all wound up. And so they think that it's anger or hostility when it could be much more complex emotions. So to, to add to Bill's point of collaborative problem solving, our advice is to have things like a family meeting. And, and you say maybe on Friday, say, look, can we maybe spend 15 minutes on Sunday sort of talking about this technology? And I would tend to lean in with, you know, starting with pause, look, I, I, I was a little unhinged. I was, you could tell I was really frustrated. And I'm sorry that I was really snappy with you. Um, I don't like doing that, but I but I also like to talk through this because I know you can't see your friends right now. And Fortnite is the only way, or or you know, Minecraft. This is how you see your friends, and I don't want to take that away from you. But I also want to. I also would like to find some balanced way so I can feel that you're you're doing your best in school. So can can we talk about this on Sunday? And then when you do, you try to figure out. 
is it reasonable for me for, for, for you to try to do this homework at this time and then do games later? Does this seem like a good idea? And you make it with them. So, because if kids feel like the plan is made with them rather than done to them, it goes a whole lot better. And for anyone who thinks, well, I just can't do that, I'm gonna do command and control. There are some kids who will burn the thing to the ground rather than abide by you know, um, rules that are put on them. And I pray to God, no one's there. If you are, go read Ross Green stuff. But you know, in the real world, you know, thing with 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 spouses, with colleagues. I mean, I'm not the tyrant and the dictator of my household. I don't agree with my wife all the time, and we have to work it out together. And I think we can start modeling that at the youngest possible age with our kids as well. That is great advice. So first of all, I just want to pause here for a moment and say we have reached the one hour mark. And for those of you who may have other commitments and you need to sign out. We want to thank you for being here with us today. We're going to stay online and answer some more questions because we've had so many wonderful questions come in. So again, if you need to sign out, remember this event will be video recorded and available on our YouTube library in a couple days once our students from the Boys and Girls Club get the video ready. Okay, so let's, let's keep going. Um, I think this is a really important question and a very vulnerable question. How do you motivate one's child when they feel helpless to help themselves, when they can't do anything and feel like they need our help? Well, for me, for the kid in that situation, I would make sure that they're screened for depression. Adele Diamond, who's this guru on executive functions, has this wonderful line where she says, if you're sad or lonely, tired, stressed, or in poor physical health, that your executive functions will be impacted first and, or, and, or, and impacted most. And goodness knows there's enough trauma across this whole country, in this, particularly in this past six months, that there's a really good chance that, that there are people on here who have kids who are doing great and they've hit the floor. And part of that also is knowing that everyone has a different vulnerability to stress. Kids who are quick to anger, who have tempers, basically have a more sensitive stress response. And so you and I could, Charlene and I could be the exact same situation, it's a little intense, but she finds it thrilling because she's confident in her ability to get through it. And I may be just kind of overwhelmed by that. And so we really wanna really keep that in mind. And again, it, it's, it's kind of a, focusing on the connection, the connection, I'm here with you. I know this is hard. You take the Ron McGon stuff of, of, of Wiggy, you know, but what I got from that is that you're having a really hard time and you feel like you just can't get this work done at all. And, you, and, you, and you're so frightened about how you're gonna do in school. Is, is that about right? And that empathy lowers the stress response and brings the problem solving part of the brain back online. And then you can also say things like, well, you know, if you don't get this done now, that's okay, but, but let's see what we can do going forward. And I know this is hard because you guys live in a corner of the world where education feels like everything. But I'll tell you this, I, uh, I grew up in, a, in, a, <laughs> in rural Connecticut, which was not very academically competitive the way that you guys are. And I had a family had about a whole bunch of stuff not going well, alcoholic father, mentally ill mother, blah, blah, blah. And I was all the way up through sixth grade. I got the best grade on every test, every mark, every paper, and every class that I took. School where I attended wasn't that hard. I didn't have a lot of competition. So I was the best student, hands down, until I wasn't. And when my parents' relationship fell apart and all kinds of bad things happening, I went from getting a hundred or close to it on everything to not doing anything. And I landed myself about three and a half months in a pediatric psychiatric hospital. So I went from 100 to what felt like a zero. And that was hard. But my parents, to the credit in all of their failed ways, they weren't worried about school. It helped that it was seventh grade, not 10th grade. I get that. But their focus was on doing their best for themselves and doing their best for me. And so I know that if you have kids, it feels like your job and their job is to have school go as well as it can. But please trust me, trust me, trust me, trust me that there are so many paths to success that don't go through, no offense, Charlene, it's a wonderful place, Stanford, right? And if you end up at Stanford, wonderful. But the idea that you have to go to a top 10% school to have top 10% life is just not true. Because for every kid there is who's post precocious, there's another kid or three who are going to be post cautious. And they're not gonna be their best lives in, when they're seven or 17, but it's gonna work out long-term. 
And the more that you can hold to that, the easier it is for them to hold to that. And as Bill said before, then to can continue to work hard, even when it's hard to work hard. And I, I'll just echo that certainly, you know, yeah. <laughs> Um, Shameless so, plug for this wonderful book, Parents. I've read a lot of parenting books as an educator in more than 30 years. It's one of the best ones I've ever read. And every chapter, chapter concludes with what you can do tonight, making it really useful. Highly recommend. I just, I just wanted to comment. Thank you, Charlene. I just wanted to comment. There's, there's a chapter in the book on motivation. And we talk about four kinds of motivational problems. And, and the fourth one is kids don't, who don't seem to be motivated for anything. As, as Ned said, the first thing we want to do is, is make sure that, there's, that they, they don't have a, a really bad sleep disorder that's been identified, rule out depression, thyroid problems, rule out cr chronic pot smoking, um, and, and make sure there's not something that we need. And if kids are really, they're completely down on themselves, completely discouraged, then, then we want to get mental health, we want to get mental health professionals involved. But, but also we have ideas in the book about the kids who are, they aren't really depressed. They just haven't found the spark yet and, and, and about how to help them. All right, um, this is a good question. It affects many modern families. Are there strategies you recommend when you are co-parenting, divorced? And my spouse and I have different views on independence, children's independence. Huh. You know, it's funny, I have a student, one of my favorite people on the planet, she's gotta be 35 now. Um, and her parents divorced when she was 10 and their family is Jewish and mom became fully Orthodox and dad became whatever the most extreme version of reforms you can possibly be. She's like, sure, have the ham, shrimp, casserole, knock yourself out. So her life, she went back and forth every other weekend between this very observant, very devout Jewish family household and the, and the absolute opposite degree. And I, my feeling on this is that we can try to lay down the law on kids, but ultimately what we're really trying to do is help kids figure out what their own laws are gonna be. I had this kid who um, her parents were saying, oh my gosh, she questions everything that we tell her. And I said, fantastic. And they looked at me like I was nuts. And I said, I don't wanna have children who reflexively do exactly what they're told without questioning it. Because those are people who don't become good citizens. They're not skeptical consumers of technology. I want my kids to say, Dad, I don't know about that. Is that really right? And then walk away and go for a walk in the woods and think about it for like the next three hours or maybe three weeks. And a perfect world will come around and say, I think you have a good point there. So if I had a kid and my and my and my rules were different from my, my ex-spouses, I would sit there and say, look, and I, I would have a conversation with your kid and say, you know, your dad and I, your mom and I have different views on this. And I just like to talk through on this. And obviously I can't control what you do really when you're outside the house or when you're with your mom or your dad. I want you to understand here where, here's where my thinking is on this. And then I would say, and here's what I think your dad's, your mom's thinking on this and be as generous as you can about their thinking. So you, they're not, you, you, you don't make your kid defensive and say, you know, ultimately you're gonna have to figure out what you feel the right thing is to do here. But here are the rules that I'd like you to abide by when you're here. And again, we're back to collaborative problem solving. So that you're respectful with them, it makes it really likely that they're going to be much. They're going to reciprocate that and be respectful with you. Um, but if you try to go command and control on what your kids are doing, particularly in another household, what I really think you're going to be doing is actually lowering yourself in in your <laughs> with with your kid and have your kid lean more towards the direction and a bunch of rules that you may think be kind of going in the wrong direction. And I'll, I'll, I'll just say, from my perspective, I agree with everything you said, my friend, but, but I also think that many of the divorced parents that I work with think that it's, think that it's the most important thing is getting the, the right thing to be done with the kid. I personally think the most important thing is treating the, the ex-spouse respectfully and letting this kid see that, you, that, that I, I still respect her, you have, you have a good mother, you have a good father. I think it's the, the disharmony between the parents and when parents hate each other, and, and the kids feel that, that, that that's worse than almost anything that, that, that we could do. So, so, so one of my colleagues wrote a book called Raising the Child You Love with the Ex You Hate, which has a, a lot of good ideas, <laughs> a lot of good ideas about how to navigate this. But, but certainly uh, and it, it happens all the time where a parent says, you know, I, I, I feel I love the approach in your book. My, my, my husband doesn't buy it. 
and, and we talk about that, do as much as you can. And, and re, have you ever read them some of the research <laughs> to really see, but don't, don't try to force them and don't make this the, the center of your relationship with your husband. If I get add to that really quickly, Bill, I think that lesson, I think it's such a good point, um, as I would frame it, about the ability to disagree agreeably and if nothing else, this election has shown us it would, it would that we would do better if we could do, if we could all do that better, because as much as I think my views on things are right, I can't be the only person on the planet. You know, I don't, I don't have some, you know, monopoly on, on solid thinking. There are lots of people who think differently and they, you know, but their thinking may be solid in its own way too. And so I, I, I build, it's such a good one to, to, if we model that with our, with our ex, um, I think it's a really healthy model because we want our kids to be able to dis uh, learning to disagree and stand up for themselves, but in an agreeable way, rather than having to resort to screaming or, or name calling. That's an incredibly valuable tool for the relationships that they're trying to have going forward. Well, and you notice Bill and Ned are using the word respect a lot, and that is really important parents. And they're using the phrase respect, respect with. And I think it's really one of the main takeaways from their book in that your child is your partner. You're not always in the driver's seat. Remember, you want your child to learn how to question because someday they're gonna be driving. Someday they're gonna choose whether they're gonna get into a car with somebody who may have had two beers. You want them to be able to say, I don't think that's a good idea or that may be okay for you, but it's not okay for me. So the more you can get this kind of dialogue going with your kids when they're younger, the better you will be when they become teenagers. All right, so a couple of quick practical questions before we wrap up. Again, thank you everybody who has submitted wonderful questions. Um, I wish we had time for all of them, but let's again do a couple of practical things because I know these are on lots of people's minds. What is your advice around after school sports, which leaves very little time for downtime? You know, my experience is that there, kids really differ in terms of how many activities they can do, how much time they need to, 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 to unwind, how quickly they do they do their homework. So it really is the, this, this talking with kids about how, how's your life working? You know, did that, and I don't want you to feel exhausted all the time. I don't, I don't want you to be bored. And I don't want you to have tons of time on, on your hand just to do nothing. But I think it really is helping kids pay, pay attention to their experience and finding out, is this working for you? And I, I, know, I know a lot of kids who, who could have practice until nine o'clock every night, and they, they get their homework before, done before practice, and they get to bed on, on 10, and, and they're fine. I know other kids who need to come home, and they need, to, they need two hours to unwind before they do anything else. I think it's a really individual thing. Perfectly said. All right. Maybe this one is for you, Ned. <laughs> um, <laughs> here's a parent. Sure. <laughs> parent says, super useful webinar. Thank you so much. How much, you mentioned radical digital downtime. How much of that do you recommend per day or per week? Radical digital downtime. Well, I don't think it's really been quantified. And again, to Bill's point, it depends on, it depends on the kid. We're, we're working on a second book with a working title, What Do You Say? And so kind of how to talk through these things with kids. And we interviewed a, 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 a guy who's a, a, a a psychologist out in the DC area who works with kids on, on, on tech screen addiction. And he talks about um, oscillating between high dopamine activities and low dopamine activities because dopamine is an excitatory molecule and you, 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 a neurotransmitter and you can't have your, you can't be like fired up all the time. It's just, you, you kind of can't do it. And so it's fine if you scroll through, you know, your social media of Instagram for 45 minutes, but to do that for four hours is a pretty bad idea. And so he talks about, you know, just going, you know, an hour on screen time and then, and then an hour off. And, and, and again, you know, you can look this stuff up. You can talk to kids respectfully about it because they know what it feels like to be, you know, six hours on, on a screen and what it looks like. For me, I would, again, do this as a collaborative problem solving and say, here's a thought that I have a concern, you know, or, or, or read that chapter in our book, or even just go to the last page of Taming the Beast of Technology of what to do tonight and talk through it. I'll tell you, there was a there was a one of our favorite experiences. There was a woman who, who left a review on Amazon, and we love you if you want to give us reviews. We always appreciate that too. And she said, you know, I was reading this book and reading this book, and I, I kept quoting all the stuff in the technology chapter to my kid, who's maybe fourteen years old. And at some point, he couldn't take it anymore, and he picked up the book and instead of throwing it across the room, took it upstairs and read the chapter on technology. And he came back down after a while, and he looked at his mom and said, 
I think it'd be help. I think I'd like your help managing my use of technology because, you know, kids understand, you know, that, that, that technology has an upside and a downside to it. And the reality is that all of us are ambivalent. All of us are ambivalent about change, right? If I were trying to lose weight, it's not like if, 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 if you know, telling someone who's overweight that giving another reason, she's probably, he's probably pretty clear about that. But we recognize that there, you, 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 my hunch is you're using this more than you maybe want to, but uh, I also know there are really great things you do on it. And again, we, we recognize the pros and cons. And you do this as family meetings say, you know, I for one would love it if we had some time in our days when we didn't do, and you just go into all the radical digital downtime. So what might, what might be a good time for you where you're, you could do that and you're not giving something up that's, that's more important. So obviously, you know, meal times, right? You know, maybe on Sunday morning, nobody touches anything until after we have, you know, pancake brunch, you know, and, and, but do it with them rather than, rather than doing it, you know, to them. For little guys, you, we can set those things up at the earliest possible thing and it just becomes habits, right? You know, just like you get in a car, you, you put your seatbelt on, you go to the bathroom, wash your hands, and it just becomes a thing, right? When you when you when we go when we go to bed, our, our cell phone charges in the kitchen, and it's just it's just what we do. So again, I would I I don't know if there's a magic number on that, but I would certainly say, you know, to have at least at least an hour in your day when you're when you're when there's no there's nothing that beeps or buzzes or, or glows anywhere near you, and on the weekends try to make them much longer periods of time. And you know, Bill, is there any science on there? There's a number there that I, <laughs> a, me a memo I missed. No, I, I, I think that that with COVID, the, the, the old limits on screen time, we, we, we have to throw it out. I mean, it, it's just yeah. not real. Yeah. I think when we think about how do we want our life to work? And what are the things that we need in our lives to, to feel good, to, to, to perform well, to learn well? And, and so we would think that we help kids think through the schedule so that, the, that they do the stuff that they have to do online in regard to learning, but that we make sure that they're out, that they're outdoors, they have their exercise. How, what about sleep? What about just having a little time just to be in your own head so you can, so, so that you can have the benefit of, the, of the, the creativity and the problem solving that comes from just being in your own mind like that. And also, what, I was just reading recently that um, with social media, there seems to be a cut point at about 30 minutes where the first 30 minutes people feel good. And after that 30 minutes, they feel, they start to feel worse. And I think asking, especially teenagers, do you have that experience? Is there a point where, where you're, you're on social media or you're online in general and just start to feel like crap, you know, and, and just helping them because again, they don't want to feel bad. They, they don't want to, to, to be constantly engaged in stuff that makes them feel terrible or makes them do terrible. And just, just that respectful way of, of talking with them with, with empathy and understanding and acknowledging that setting limits on technology ain't easy for us either. And just in telling, and being honest about our own temptations uh, is, is a pretty useful thing too. So true. I was just going to say what you said, Bill. My daughter is 29 and she took herself off of all technology. And even her brother said, not all technology, I'm sorry, all social media. And even her brother said, it won't last, it won't last. Well, it has lasted. It's been a year and a half and she is calmer and more focused and happier. And she's a happy person than she's ever been. Does not regret it. And listen, parents, your kids know that technology doesn't always feel good. Just as Bill just said, they know that it can make them feel bad about themselves. Just like when we get on Facebook and our friends are all traveling to places they shouldn't be traveling to, we all know that. All right, so listen, gentlemen, I'm gonna wrap up with my favorite question. I owe this question to my friend, Becky Beacom, who's the Parent Engagement Director at Palo Alto Medical Foundation. What gives you hope for the future? Kids. Well, for, for, Kids. Me, for me. In I more than one word. Okay, fair. For, for me, I, I see this, this current, what's happening in our world right now is our planets letting us know that we can't, we have to have a different relationship with life on, on this planet. And, and that we can't continue to, to basically abuse the, the, our, our home. And, this, and that we're really the virus right now. And I think that, that, that it makes me very optimistic to think that, that we, we wanna survive and we will have to, to work together just to, to solve our problems and, and, and to make living on earth, living together more hospitable. And I, and I think that for me, I, I just see this moving in an evolutionary direction. Um, and I also think that 
you know, the, 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 the people who, who lived through World War I and lived through the Great Depression, we call them the greatest generation. And it's, it, and it's, it's not, certainly they had their wounds, but they also had incredible resilience and in, in, in power. And we, I don't want kids to be traumatized. I don't, I don't want, but I also don't feel sorry if they go through some hard times and, and can learn from it and, and, and can learn that I, I, get, I, 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 I have confidence in my ability to handle hard stuff. Thank you, Bill. Ned, I'm going to give you the last word. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, you know, I'm right there, you know, with, with Bill's thinking on this, you know, that I remember reading that there's an article, it's probably a year or two after um, September 11th, and they talked about how there are all these folks who were really, um, you know, still struggling, still traumatized with it, um, even if they weren't directly impacted by it. And we know that this is, that this is um, again, that, that these difficulties that we're facing um, from social justice, from economic adversity, from the, the, from the election, from the pandemic is impacting people differently. And I want to be sympathetic about this because some people, I mean, I have some friends like, this is great. I've always been an introvert. I love life online. And other people have, have really been, you know, pancaked by this. But, you know, I work on the assumption that everybody wants their lives to work out. And you know that 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 article back in September, the post September uh, 11, simply you know was reflecting on the, the the poetic observation that this too shall pass. There have been so many times in human history where people think, could it ever get any worse? These are the darkest times that we've ever seen. And as Bill said, sometimes you know we have to go through that. We have to go through that darkness. There's a, I think it's Oscar Wilde. Uh, I'd seen this from a student who had a little journal. She'd been hospitalized for a suicide attempt. And there's a little, a little, I think it's Oscar Wilde says, when it's dark, look for the stars, right? And when it's raining, you look for a rainbow. And it sounds really Pollyannish, but the fabulous William James, who founded the Department of Psychology at Harvard and probably knew a thing or two about psychology, also said that our experience consists of that which we choose to attend to. So there are a lot of things that are really hard right now. And we, it, it's important for us to allocate time and energy to making things go better, to heal in our world, to make it more just. And, but still, there are things in our lives, you know, California's a beautiful place to go and take a walk. You gotta use a mask, but it's still a beautiful corner of the world. Your children are way too much time on screen time, but you know what, they're still wonderful kids and you love them with all your heart. So it's, it, it's, a, it's a hard thing to both be paying attention to things that are hard and, and we worry about them. But I think it's also great for us to pick our eyes up from time to time and look at all the things around us that we can, with a little bit of effort, feel grateful about, knowing that that also changes not only our energy, but the energy of people around us and collectively the energy of the world. So we get our place to that, get ourselves as a group together to the place that we we're trying to get to. Well, I think that is beautiful advice for us to end today's session on. Thank you all the attendees who are with us today. Thank you for your kind words and people are buying the book online while we're talking. So again, thank you for your questions, your comments, but a huge thank you to Ned and Bill today um, for your brilliance and your wisdom and your peacefulness and calm. We wish you all the best. Stay healthy, stay well, everybody. And we hope to see you again soon. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.